Amen. All right. Keep your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So tonight we're going to talk about um, your body, your physical body. We're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to depress you even further. <laughs> so, do you understand why we're not doing a series on violence, though, by the way? Because that's just uh, that's a, it's a hard topic to talk about. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to talk about the physical importance of your body tonight. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, you know, 15, it says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? So your bodies are the members of Christ. And in verse 19, he says, Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And guess what? The Bible says that your body is not yours. It says that it doesn't belong to you. You were bought. You were paid for. If you're saved tonight, you were purchased. And it, you were purchased with a heavy price. So the Bible doesn't talk a lot about, you know, it doesn't put a lot of emphasis on the physical. But I want to show you tonight that there's things in the Bible and things that there's reasons that God is telling us to do certain things in the Bible. They're there to protect us. They're there to protect our lives. They're there to protect us against death, even physical death. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about the physical importance of following a biblical lifestyle. The first thing I want to talk about tonight, turn to James chapter 1. So I've mentioned this many times in sermons, but basically, you know, God's laws, He doesn't have all these laws that are just there because God just wants to watch a bunch of puppets on a string dance. You know, God's laws actually make a lot of sense for us. They, they actually are there to help and protect us. All right. And the first point I want to make tonight as you're turning to James chapter 1 is that sin itself, meaning the transgression of God's law, will destroy your physical body. Sin will destroy your physical body. Look at James 1 in, in uh, verse number 15. The Bible says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Of course, you know, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. You know, we talk about that second death. But look, sin can actually cause you to physically die. Right? Now, it could be the judgment of God that's actually killing you. You know, like God has killed some saved people in the Bible. You know, God could actually be chastising you. But sin itself will destroy you physically in many ways. Okay? Now, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when he's talking about your body being the temple of the Holy Ghost... He's actually talking about the sin of fornication. It's a very specific sin. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and look at verse number 18. Where the Bible says, it says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So the Bible says that there's a unique thing about fornication. That fornication is you actually sinning against your physical self. It's going to actually hurt you physically. Look at verse number 15 where he says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. So in the context, he's preaching against fornication, talking about taking care of your body. So if we look at what's happening today around us, are, are people around us living a biblical lifestyle? Is a biblical lifestyle common in the United States? No, it's not. People are leaving the biblical lifestyle. People are not getting married anymore. People have never gotten married at later, at, at older ages than the United States right now. In the history of the United States, the married age has never been older than it is now. People are living in fornication. Fornication is normal for kids in, in school. It's accepted. And people as adults, it's just an accepted thing to just live in fornication with a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. But guess what? This is destroying people's bodies. From the CDC, I mean, all of these different STDs, the Bible, or not the Bible, but the CDC actually says that are on, like, one of them's on a 20% increase since 2014, you know, 63% increase for another one. Syphilis, which I actually thought didn't even exist anymore, is 71% increase in the United States. And that can be passed to babies from childbirth from their mothers. You know, 50% of, of, of kids ages 18 to 24 will get a sexually transmitted disease. 50%, that's half. 
Currently, 110 million Americans have an STD. Americans, by being so smart and so enlightened, leaving the biblical lifestyle, are destroying themselves. 110 million. There's 320 million people in the United States. That's one in three, folks. You know, so that's the irony. The irony of like what's happening today is that we're already a nation full of sickness. We're already a nation full of sickness. And by the way, the, I, you just couldn't help but run into this when you're looking through all these CDC stats, but they're the biggest spreaders of disease are homosexuals. There's always like a star asterisk where it says, oh, by the way, at most risk are, you know, um, homosexuals, you know, with multiple anonymous partners and use of illegal drugs because, you know, all those three things go together. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, but they're nice people. Nice people. That's just a, a side note. But my point I'm trying to make is that fornication, as the Bible actually says, literally destroys you physically. It destroys your body. It causes, you know, ends up causing cancer. It ends up causing, you know, infertility. All these different things. It literally ruins your body. That's why it says that he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It literally destroys your body. Flee from it. Run from it the Bible says. I mean, there's huge pressures out there today. One of the biggest benefits of separation and a separated family and a homeschooled family and a separated church is this one right here, Amen. is that you can flee fornication, that these kids will grow up and there will not be that pressure. Amen. There will not be that. They'll be raised in a proper environment. But it's important. It's important that you separate from what's normally happening out there, or it's a flip of a coin what's going to happen to your children. You can separate them from it. That's why we teach separation here. Okay? These things could literally destroy your children physically. Literally. But not just for the children, you know, even the adults out there. Now this, look, this was a big debate in the Bible. Turn to Acts 15. Acts 15. If you remember, in Acts 15, here you had Paul you know, he's out preaching to the Gentiles and he comes to Jerusalem and there's all these Pharisees saying that, hey, what are we going to do with all these Gentiles that are getting saved? You know, they don't follow all these rules, all these laws like we do. You know, the Jews had a very, a very strict lifestyle and everything that they ate and how they acted and all these different things. So there's this big debate. And then, of course, it got pushed into salvation, right? I mean, do you need to be, you know, circumcised to be saved and all these things? But mainly the issue was, what do we do with these Gentiles once they get saved? What do we do? And after the debate, James, you know, the brother of Jesus, who is, you know, he just, he just lays down the law and he says, after everybody said their piece in verse number 20, James says this, he says, but that we write unto them, this is his sentence, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Look, fornication made the, the short list here. So we're sitting here and we're deciding, hey, what do we do with all these heathens, these Gentiles that are getting saved? You know, are, do we have to make them like follow all the rules of the Jews? And he's like, no. He's like, we'll just tell them to do these four things. And fornication was one of them because it was a sin against their own body. And he knew that it was a, it was a big deal. It wasn't about salvation here. It's just well, how do we teach them to live after they've, got, they've accepted the gospel? Okay? Now look. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Don't think God will protect you because you're saved. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Actually, turn to Numbers chapter 25, and I'm just going to read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is talking about a story from Numbers chapter 25. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse number 8, the Bible says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Turn to Numbers chapter 25. So this is referring to a story in the Old Testament where the children of Israel committed fornication with these heathen people, and God brought judgment upon them. Look at Numbers chapter 25 in verse number 1, where the Bible says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. They were not to, you know, mix with the people, even marry with them, but they were not 
marrying them here. They were committing fornication. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this guy was not obeying. He's just like, whatever, I'm going to do what I want to do, and you guys aren't going to tell me what to do. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, he took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Now we have a Bible contradiction here. Let me just get this out of the way, right? So we have 23,000 in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 10 in verse number 8, and Numbers 25, verse 9, everyone's like, the Bible's contradicting itself. But what does 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 8 says? It says, and fell in one day, 3 and 20,000. So in one day, 23,000 people died, but total, 24,000 died. There you go. <laughs> it's not rocket surgery, right? All right, so God judges fornication. Back to my point. God judges fornication. Flee from it. Other sins, other than fornication, turn to Proverbs chapter 23. Other sins that will destroy your body, your physical body. Look, God's rules make sense. They make sense. Look at Proverbs 23. Look at verse number 29. Look, I, all, all I hear about people doing these days is just staying home and just getting drunk. I mean, that's what people are doing at home from my perspective. I mean, they're just like, they better not close the liquor stores. I mean, there is so many people in this city, in this state, in this country that they're just, they're just drinking. And now they're drinking way more than they used to because they're just sitting home and it's all they want to do is drink. Proverbs 23, look at verse 29. The Bible says this, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? Look, these are all like physical conditions, right? I mean, you're, do we really even need doctors when we have this kind of like, I mean, look at this. You, you'll be depressed. You'll, you'll, you'll have family problems, the second one. Who hath, I mean, you'll say stupid things. You'll just get hurt and you won't even know why. Wounds without a cause. Redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not upon the wine when it is red. When it giveth color in the cup, it moveth itself aright. Redness of eyes. It literally, when you drink, it literally like bursts the, blood, blood, the tiny little blood vessels in your eyes. That's why people that they drink, their eyes are red. Because their, their eyes are literally bleeding. They're just inflamed, these blood vessels. Verse number 32. At last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. And then it ties again with fornication. 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lie down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it again. Look, it, it says people are going to beat you up physically, and you're not even going to know it's happening. Think of that. Drunkenness and not being sober are actually tied to fornication and filth in the Bible. And that's exactly what the CDC will tell you as well. When you come look at stats and like just behavior that you know, causes all these STDs and all of this, look, there's long-term physical effects as well. I mean, you say that, okay, the, 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 all these things happening to you is like you know, one day or one night that happened. But look, there's long-term physical effects to alcohol as well. 
The, you know, the Mayo Clinic says drinking too much alcohol can raise blood pressure to unhealthy levels, and if you keep drinking alcohol, you'll end up with, you can end up with chronic blood pressure problems, meaning your blood pressure raises when you drink alcohol, but then if you just you drink all the time, you're, it just, you're, your arteries harden, not to get into it, but I mean, you'll just have high blood pressure, period. It'll just, it'll just stay that way. Substance abuse and hypertension is a huge problem. Substance abuse and hypertension are important health concerns, especially in adolescent and young adults presenting with elevated, just think about it, young people with elevated blood pressure and associated cardiovascular conditions. Illicit drugs, including cocaine, marijuana, amphetamines, and I can't even pronounce that one, remain potential sources of acute and newly diagnosed hypertension. And all of this leads to what they call heart disease in the United States. Now, heart disease is tied to high blood pressure, diabetes, drinking alcohol also causes diabetes, by the way. But heart disease is a cause of 647,000 deaths in the United States every single year. Heart disease. That's one, one in four deaths in the United States is from heart disease. Wow. And all of these things, you know, increase it. From Harvard Health, alcohol abuse, drunkenness is a cause of all these things. Dementia, depression, anxiety, suicide, family problems. I mean, so far the Bible's caught most of these already. Family problems, unemployment, cancer of the mouth, throat, liver, colon, and breast, cirrhosis of the liver, and diabetes is the biggest one. So all these things, well, I mean, the, the use of alcohol, illegal drugs, is they'll, they'll destroy your body. They will destroy your body. And the longer that you do it, the more damage that there will be. Drugs, look, just look at these people walking around California. Yeah, man. I mean, just look at these people. I used to tell Vladi when we were standing outside the church, you know, we would literally, wa we're watching these people die. Years and years we're standing outside being ushers and we see the same guy go to the methadone clinic and get high and, and do heroin or whatever. And we're literally watching these people wither away and die in front of our very eyes. But I told Vladi one time, I was like, man, I was like, it's, it's amazing what the human body can take. You just watch these people wither away into these skeletons and just, they're just destroyed. They're, they're not the right color anymore. They, their minds don't work anymore. Their bodies are broken. And you're just like, it's amazing. What, what the human body can take. But it will kill them. It will eventually, physically kill them. You know, smoking destroys your, your heart, your lungs. So all of these things, all of these, you know, being sober, that's why the Bible says be sober. Amen. And it covers everything. It covers all the drugs, alcohol, everything. So the whole argument about whether or not, you know, oh, is this wine here in the Bible, alcohol, and this, it's, it's stupid. The Bible says be sober, period. And when you're drinking alcohol, you're not sober. So the Bible says be sober. And if you're not sober, if you're drinking alcohol, doing drugs, it will destroy you physically, is the point of this sermon. My third point is this. You should stay in physical condition or in physical shape. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. You should be physically active. You should try to keep yourself in some sort of shape. That is biblical. Okay? And I'm going to show you now. I'm going, to, I'm going to come after the ladies here. Then I'm going to get on the guys. <laughs> Go to Proverbs 31. So Proverbs 31, of course, the virtuous woman is who we're talking about. But look at what the Bible says about the virtuous woman. So the virtuous woman does all these things. She's, she's very hardworking. She's, she's supporting her family. She's doing all these things. She gets up early. You know, her husband praiseth her, her children, and her husband call her blessed. I mean, there's so many great things. But look at verse 16 of Proverbs 31, where the Bible says, She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. The, the virtuous woman is no weakling. She's a strong woman, physically. I mean, she's doing all this thing. And by the way, turn to Ruth, chapter 2. There's only one woman in the Bible that, that the Bible actually says is a virtuous woman, and that's Ruth. So let's look and see if there's a correlation here. The Bible says in Proverbs 31 that the, that the virtuous woman is physically strong. 
I mean, it makes sense. When you read Proverbs 31 and you th see all the things that this woman is doing, she can't possibly be just, just, just this weakling or this person that, you know, just lays around and can't even, you know, walk across the room without getting tired. I mean, it's not possible. So look at Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 15. Of course, Ruth came with her, her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Ruth goes to take care of her mother-in-law. And in verse number 15, the Bible says, And when she was risen up to glean, I bet she rose up early, by the way. When she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young man, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So, I mean, just think about this. Do you guys know what a barley plant looks like? It's like, it's got a head on it like that, right? So it's, it's not a huge thing. It's not a huge thing you just pick up. I mean, she's literally like either on her hands and knees or bending down constantly all day, picking up these little heads of barley. Or these, and they probably weren't even full heads of barley. She's gleaning. They've already harvested. Boaz was nice. She had already done it, and Boaz was nice and said, hey, throw some on the, on the ground for her. Throw some extra on the ground for her. But she's literally going, and she's, she's picking up these pieces all day long. And then she's not done, right? She's not done. In order to, you know, the combine comes in today, you know, it takes the head of wheat or barley, and then it beats it, and it gets all the, the chaff off, and the, the kernels fall out. Right? We used to, when we were kids, we would take it in a head of wheat, we would rub it in our hands, and then we would, we would blow the chaff away, and then you would have all the wheat kernels in your hand, and then you could eat it. We would always do that as kids during harvest time. But what she did was she gleaned all these heads of barley, and then she went and she beat it all out and, and cleaned the chaff out. I mean, she worked until late at night, I'm sure, here. Okay? So she must have had some considerable strength. Turn to Ruth chapter 3. And it fits perfectly because if you look at Ruth chapter 3 and verse number 11, when Ruth goes in to ask Boaz, you know, if he would, you know, do his duty and marry her, he says this in Ruth chapter 3, 11, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a, Proverbs 31, virtuous, woman. So here we see that Ruth, you know, she was no physical weakling. Okay, so it was important, and it's part of being a virtuous woman. So there's reason to keep yourself in shape, ladies. There's reason for that. Now let's look at the men. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. This is where it gets depressing, men. So get ready. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23 is the, 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 the describing the mighty men of David. The mighty men of David. And if you ever want to feel like not so much of a man, just read this chapter. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Just look down at verse number 8. We'll just read a couple verses. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachamite that sat on the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 and, you know, you're saying, okay, he slew 800 men, like, in his life. No. At whom he slew at one time. So in one battle, this man slew 800 men. Can you imagine how physically hard that must have been? I mean, that, that's a lot of work to actually, you know, physically battle 800 people. Verse number 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Aho Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they, defied, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together in battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. He fought so hard, Brother Trevor talked about this last night, that he literally couldn't open his hand anymore. This has happened to me. I remember it happened to me when I was a teenager, wrestling matches. You would, you would just, six minutes, right? Six minutes, and you, after the wrestling match is over, you're, 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 you're gripping your forearm so much that I would literally have to go up against a wall and go like this to get my hands to open again because your, your muscles just lock up. That's what happened to him. He fought 
and fought and fought until his hand wouldn't let go of the sword anymore. That's how hard he was gripping the sword and how long he was gripping the sword. So look, these were obviously very extremely physically strong men in, in the Bible. Now, let's look at the U.S. today. There's something happening in the United States today. From a 2017 article in Forbes magazine, testosterone levels are dropping on average by 1% per year since the 1980s. That's depressing. A 2016 study showed that the average 20 to 34 year old man could apply 98 pounds of force with a right hand grip and this was down from 117 pounds in 1985. So in 2016, men could apply with their right hand 198 pounds in 2016, and in 1985, on average, that was 117 pounds. So men are getting weaker. Testosterone levels are dropping. By the way, just a side note, you know, the Bible says in Revelation, turn to Revelation uh, 13. 13, 16, and causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Talking about the mark of the beast. Guess what? Why the right hand? You ever think about that? Well, here's something to think about. Like 90 to 98 percent of people, depending on who you ask, are right-handed. Not me. <laughs> I'm left-handed. Anyway, but I mean, that's just a, just a thought, okay? But look, men are getting weaker in this country. Men are getting weaker in this country. Turn to Jeremiah 51. Turn to Jeremiah 51. The Bible talks about this too. This could be judgment. Men are getting weaker. Jeremiah 51. Look down at verse number 30. Jeremiah 51 is talking about the judgment coming to Babylon now. Jeremiah 51 and verse number 30. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They're getting weaker. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. So you say, you know, that's depressing. What can we do? Well, here's some advice from the Endocrine Society. A new study finds that a drop in testosterone levels over time is more likely to result from a man's behavioral and health changes than by aging. So they're starting to think, they're starting to realize that this whole phenomenon that's happening here, just from a scientific level, is not just because you're getting older. All right, It's because of your lifestyle and the things that you're consuming. And you know what? This goes back to alcohol as well. Because there's a lot of alcohol consum consumed in this country and it has proven that that will drop your testosterone levels. All right. So, many times this is also associated with obesity, diabetes, and depression. Now, there's so many factors involved, but one thing that a lot of them agree on is that lifestyle in general, along with increased consumption of low standard food, are major contributors to this testosterone drop in the United States. People literally agree on that. It's what you eat and how you live, period is what's doing it. It's the common denominator. So a, com a common denominator, actually, what we're, all, we're talking about, whether it's, it's alcohol, drugs, or you know, low testosterone levels, is diabetes, too. Diabetes is huge in the United States. From the CDC, now this is shocking. I did not know this. More than 100 million US adults are now living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes means that you will have diabetes in five years. 100 million U.S. adults. There's, I mean, that's, that's, there's 320 million people in the United States. All right? This report finds that as of 2015, 30 million Americans, 10% of the U.S. population have diabetes. Another 84 million have prediabetes, a condition that if not treated, often leads to type 2 diabetes within five years. Look, we are not healthy in this country. Now here's one thing that, you know, with diabetes that I will tell you right now that is true about the United States. We eat way more sugar in this country than any other country in the world. We put sugar on everything. Everything that we have is based in sugar. And, you know, 
Let me tell you something, aside from diabetes itself, there's so many new studies coming out saying that sugar aids in cancer growth. Sugar just depletes your, I mean, look at the, the doctor from Faithful Word LA talking about how to protect against the coronavirus. She said, you know what the worst thing you could do is eat a lot of sugar. She said, don't even drink orange juice because even though the vitamin C is good for you, the sugar that's in the orange juice will just negate the vitamin C because it attacks you. Look, sugar is, I mean, I'm going to confess my faults here. Sugar is a problem, you know, that I need to get rid of in, in my life. But it's, look, it's a huge problem for Americans. It's a lifestyle thing. There's immune system studies now. I mean, sugar destroys your body, period. Eat healthy, natural food. Don't become a food Nazi, but eat healthy, natural food. One person told me one time that you should never eat anything out of a cardboard box. That's pretty good advice. I'm not saying that I follow it, but it's pretty good advice. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. There is something to the sugar thing. I'm, I'm telling you that. There's, it's coming up in, in real studies, especially the cancer thing. The cancer thing, I mean, I, mean I, I don't like the keto thing, but the keto thing is basically the opposite of a sugar diet, right? I mean, you're not having any carbs, and the keto thing has proven to you know, fix all sorts of ailments, from diabetes to you know, helping you know, get rid of cancer and all sorts of things, but it's, you know, it's, the, it's no sugar, basically. It's no carbohydrates. All right, look at 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 8, where the Bible says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Look, it says bodily exercise profiteth little, but I mean, there's still profit there. All right, there's still profit there. So we should exercise, we should eat right. Look, to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. We get that, but hey, I just don't want to end my life here because of sin and an unhealthy lifestyle. Let's put it that way. I'm not afraid to die, but I don't want to die because I ate Twinkies my whole life. And I, you know, and I only lived to be 60. I don't want to die because I smoked, you know, five packs of cigarettes a day. You know, I don't want to end my life that way. Look, this body is a gift, right? This body is a gift. It was, it, it was and it's not ours. It's, it's purchased, right? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And guess what? It's corruptible. It's corruptible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 53. I mean, you can corrupt this thing, is basically the whole point of this sermon. You have a body, you know, your body is not yours. It was bought with a price, the price of the, you know, the blood of Christ, and it's corruptible. You can corrupt it. Look at verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. One day, we're going to have, you know, a glorified body. You know, we're going to put on incorruption, but not now. It's not what I have now. This thing right here is corruptible. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. But look, you can corrupt this thing. You can corrupt it through sin, through fornication, through poisoning it. You can corrupt it. You can corrupt it through your lifestyle, through a, a sedimentary lifestyle, by the way. You know, it's, it's as, they're finding out lately, and this is a little depressing as well, but it is as bad to have a sedimentary office job as it is to smoke. You're starting to see like stand-up desks everywhere, you know, in the office environments and all that kind of thing, because they're coming out with all these studies that says, you know what, you might as well smoke. If you have an office job where you sit in front of a computer all day, because it's killing you just the same. Just this sedimentary lifestyle. So look, maybe, maybe, just a thought, but maybe there's nothing wrong with working by the sweat of your face. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that. But are we told that today? I mean, if you have a job where you actually have to get up and, you know, grab a tool and actually do something. I mean, that's frowned upon today in America. No, you got to get one of these jobs where you sit down and you just, you know, get hemorrhoids and die, basically. <laughs> I mean, I guess. You know? I mean, 
But that's what the United States, and, and all these studies are coming out saying it's, it's terrible for you. It's terrible for you. But the Bible says that you should work by the sweat of your face. You know, and work hard. And guess what? You know, then you'll live, and I have men in my family that that's true. You know, ships and men rust at port. In conclusion, you know, people, you know, you'll see a lot of people who are young and they're, in, they're just doing whatever they want because they think, you know what, I can get away with it and, you know, I'm young and nothing ever is wrong with me because I'm, you know, 20, 30 years old. But guess what? You're going to be 80 one day and then you're going to reap the whirlwind of what you sowed today. Now, Caleb is a great example for us in the Bible. I love this guy. He doesn't get enough mention in my, in my opinion. But turn to Joshua chapter 14. Caleb. You remember Caleb? He was with Joshua, right? He was one of the spies. Caleb was one of the spies. He was one of the faithful men that came back and wasn't that had faith and said, you know what? They are big and they are, but you know what? The Lord is with us. And he, he was one of the, you know, one of the men that was with Joshua. Look at Joshua 14 and verse number 7. Caleb is talking here. And Caleb says, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren went up with me and made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore that day, saying, Surely the land where thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord kept me alive, and he said, These forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He's saying, you know what? He's already gone into the promised land. You know, he's fought the battles. And you know what? He's 85 years old now. It's 45 years later. And look what he says in verse number 11. This reminds me of my grandfather. It's verse number 11 here. He says, As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and to come in. He's saying, I can still fight. I remember when my grandpa was still alive. We moved out before we um, took over the farm. We lived like just a few miles from my grandpa because I was like, you know what? I'll be able to help him out on the farm. He's 90. I'll be able to help him out with you know, the fencing and all this. But he would always just call me out after everything was done all the time. And I was so annoyed with it. But he'd go and he'd be like, I put that fence post in with this sledgehammer by myself. Can you do that? <laughs> He's 90. You know, he reminded me of Caleb. I hope that I am this strong when I am 85. You know, I hope that, you know, that, that the Lord would bless me with that. But look, if you destroy your body when you're young, you have no chance at, at being Caleb here. So you have to be a good steward of, what, of this, this temple, of the Holy Ghost. Right? I'm not talking about being vain, but I'm talking about just being a good steward of what God has given you. And teach your children to be good stewards. You'll find that healthy parents will have healthy children because they're learning the lifestyle through you. You know, what you do is more important than what you say. And if you say ice cream is bad, and then you're always going out for ice cream. I know, I'll fix it. But what you do is more important than what you say. Okay? So the more time, look, the more time you spend in these bad things, the worse it will be for you. You know, and just, just keep in mind that, you know, you young people, keep in mind, you will be old one day. And those things that you did in your youth will come back to you. They'll come back around. It's, it's reaping and sowing. It's just a, it's a great physical example of reaping and sowing. What you sow today, you will reap when you're 80. And as we see today, you know, you want to be strong when you're older because this world is constantly attacking your body and, you know, just you want to be strong. You want to be like Caleb when you're old. So your physical body is not, you know, the most important thing. The inside of the cup is obviously more important. But, you know, your physical body is important. You know, and it's important that, you know, you, you keep yourself healthy and you do these things and just don't fall into all the sin of this world that will destroy your body and will destroy, you know, your children. And remember that these laws that God has put in the Bible are there to protect us and protect us physically and spiritually.
but physically as well. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for all these people that would be faithful to the house of God, Lord. Uh, I just thank you for your word and all the things that, that are in it for us and for our safety and for our protection. I ask that you would just, uh, just help us to, to read it and learn it and understand it, Lord. Lord, I ask that you, um, you, know, you bless the rest of our week and uh, keep us all safe and healthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>